complex at power plan that's what we do plain and simple we help make your life easier with power plan accounting tax finance operations it and regulatory departments get the clarity in financial and operational data they need to make decisions that improve overall organizational performance Power Plan was started based on a simple premise. We know that the more fixed assets a company has, the more challenging it is to manage them financially and keep up with ever-changing rules and regulations, all while planning for tomorrow. Key questions like, how many assets are you being taxed on that are no longer your assets? How hard is it to keep up with multiple financial spreadsheets across multiple departments? Can you be sure your organization is compliant with recent regulatory changes? All can be a challenge if you don't have the detailed level of information you need. PowerPlan's award-winning software answers these questions by leveraging data from your ERP, EAM, and other financial systems to create a single, highly detailed platform, giving you real-time access to granular data across the organization that helps departments make better decisions. For more than 25 years, PowerPlan has helped asset-intensive businesses optimize their financial performance and achieve achieve regulatory compliance. PowerPlan manages the interfaces between all sources of transactions, thus allowing key decision makers to see the same set of data through different lenses. With this clarity comes confidence. PowerPlan empowers companies to make optimal decisions for their overall strategy by putting financial data at the fingertips of anyone across the organization based on their role at any time, allowing everyone to be on the same virtual page. From Fortune 1000s to local entities, today we help more than 300 companies across multiple industries meet regulatory compliance and strategically plan for the future. Customers come to us and stay with us because of our ability to provide them clarity and confidence. That is what PowerPlan can bring to your organization. PowerPlan, we make the complex simple.
Good afternoon, I'm Ben Folk, EEI Chairman and Chairman and CEO of Excel Energy. I hope everybody's enjoying the EEI Leadership Summit as much as I am. We're really grateful for your participation. And I'm delighted to introduce the closing program for day one of our summit, which will look closely at an issue I'm passionate about, our industry's clean energy transition, the march towards a low and eventually zero carbon future. As an electric company CEO, I know this is a major priority for our company, for our customers, and of course, for the climate. But I also know it's a difficult journey, and that journey gets harder the further we go. That's why I'm glad we've assembled an all-star cast of thought leaders to help sort out all the details today. And I'm especially pleased that I'm able to turn this conversation over to my friend Dan Jurgen, the founder and chairman of Zero Week and a world-class moderator in his own right. I would like to thank the sponsors of this general session, Oracle Utilities and Power Plan, and we look forward to seeing you for day two of our digital summit. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I'm Dan Jurgen, Vice Chairman of IHS Market. And I'm very pleased to be here to talk about what's ahead for the clean energy transition. And we have a terrific panel to do that. And of course, it's very timely for all the reasons you know from COVID to uh, an election that's gonna shortly occur. Maybe I will just say a few words to set the scene for what we're talking about. As everyone knows, US generating fleet is turning over. And despite uh, the pandemic, a record amount of renewables will be added in the US in 2020. But the question and really the reason for this panel is what will be the pace and what will be the drivers? Will it be markets? Will it be government policy? Will it be technology? And by the way, what challenges will we encounter along the way? Of course, there's a related question of what impact COVID-19 will have as a headwind or a tailwind for decarbonization, which is something that a uh, topic that I've wrestled with in, in my new book, that's just uh, the new map that's just coming out. Our own research at IHS Market points to sustained pace of change in many markets as the low cost renewables displace fossil resources and we expect these low costs along with decarbonization policies, utilities, what companies are doing, what you all are doing, and of course, the outcome of the election will drive a doubling of installed renewable and storage capacities within the decade and a sustained pace of coal retirements. Uh, in addition, there will be challenges to new fossil plant development in some states. At the same time, of course, uh, we see uh, complexity ahead. Uh, as renewable penetrations increase, reserve margins tighten, the value of firm dispatchable resources will increase, and we'll need more batteries and other things to complement renewables. California's mid-August blackouts, rolling blackouts, are very much on the mind of, I think, everybody. And the challenges that markets may encounter as renewables make up an increasing portion of the supply mix. Uh, our own work just points, the paper we just did on California, points to one of the major contributing factors being low wind output at essentially the same time that every available power plant was being called upon to meet demand, and some resources just may not have been there. We saw something like that in Texas last year. So markets will need a lot of new technology to deal with fluctuations in wind and solar output. And COVID-19 will have an impact on markets. Uh, certainly there was a power disruption earlier this year uh, at least our numbers indicate that power demand was down about 10% in early April. At that same time, U.S. gasoline demand was down 49%. And now we think power demand is down about 4%. And you all will have different views in your service area. But gasoline demand, again, by comparison, is down about uh, 20%. And we're seeing a rebound. Uh, the rebound, of course, is fragile and raised on the pace of economic recovery and the pandemic and uh, what happens with stimulus. A second wave of infections or a continuing wave of infections uh, and business closures could once again disrupt uh, demand. I'd have to say one thing our economists are very focused on, and this is important for all companies, is what's gonna happen to small business, the degree to which they'll survive. 44% of private sector employment are in small businesses and particularly challenging for them. And then there's the whole behavioral challenges and questions that people learn to be remote. What will be the future of work? Where will work be? 
How will people get to work? What will they drive? All of those kind of questions. And on top of that is the question of the outcome of the election, and we will speculate a little bit on that. So we have a great, uh, really distinguished group of uh, people to discuss this topic. Uh, we have Jerry Anderson, who's the executive chairman of DTE Energy. Uh, uh, Ernie Moniz, the former energy secretary, Professor Emeritus of MIT and CEO of Energy Future Initiative. Gina McCarthy, the former EPA administrator, who in January of this year became the president of Natural Resources Defense Council. And Fred Krupp, who's the president of the Environmental Defense Fund. So welcome to you all. Uh, look forward to this discussion. We have a lot to talk about. I guess we might start talking about uh, California. Bernie, you did a study last year, your Energy uh, uh, Institute, on the question of, uh, of the getting the balance right in California. Uh, what's your diagnosis of what's happened in California and what needs to be done to remedy it? Well, uh, first of all, Dan, I think uh, your statement about variability is, is something that we emphasized uh, last, uh, last year in our report, and it may be worth uh, repeating a couple of the key uh, issues there. Uh, frankly, in both California and Texas, uh, uh, this, this is apart from the current, the current situation, uh, but we find that the fluctuations, not, on, uh, not simply on very short time scales, but like on weak time scales, are very large in, in both places. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, given our latitude, it's not surprising that with solar, for example, uh, we have uh, twice as much insulation in the summer as in the winter. And so that's all a way of saying, uh, again, referring to your earlier statement, that there are tremendous uh, challenges in front of us for addressing the variability, not simply on like our time scales, where batteries are uh, certainly coming uh, much more into focus, but on days and weeks and even seasonal time scales. So, uh, a key issue, and it is true today in California, is uh, we've, we need to do more in terms of looking at the, how the whole system fits together with reliability and resilience. Now, in California, I would just say today, uh, a big problem is uh, really capacity. Uh, right now, there's a shortage of capacity. Uh, yeah, that's quite apart from, from how much solar or wind there is. Uh, for example, the two gigawatts lost uh, of nuclear from San Onofre uh, a few years ago uh, is a major issue. Uh, declining capacity on gas. Um, while we still don't have the kind of storage solutions that we will need for, uh, for solar, uh, those are all coming into play. And to emphasize what you implied, at least, there are correlations. Uh, so when we have these triple-digit temperature days uh, and by the way, have them also in neighboring states uh, who are often called upon uh, to help with load, uh, and they can't do it right now. But the same hot days that provide the enormous capacity in the afternoon with solar also leads to the wind uh, typically not being uh, anywhere near as strong. So I think, frankly, we're in a period of transition, uh, and uh, California will need to uh, be concerned about adding capacity and about adding uh, uh, more robust system integration uh, so that these kinds of correlations uh, don't come in and, cr and create these shortfalls. Thank you, Ernie. Well, you talk about uh, transition. Uh, Jerry, uh, DTE has a transition in terms of its new uh, uh, decarbonization goals. Uh, tell us what you're trying to do there uh, and uh, you know, what kind of what the challenges are to implementing it, what it takes to get to get them in, implemented. Yeah, well, thanks, Dan. And, and uh, we are taking on that challenge at DTE, but I'll, before I get to that, I'll say the industry uh, is moving on that front far faster than we would have anticipated three, four years ago. So 2019, the industry was down 33%, but when you look at uh, investor-owned companies like ours, on average down 45%. You know, if you look back to 2016, we were wrestling to get our heads around 32% by 2030. So th things are on the move, uh, including at DTE. So we've committed to net zero by 2050 and 80% by 
2040 and 50 by 2030. And everything in our strategy is now being driven uh, by that commitment. And I mean that quite literally. And we're doing just an intense amount of modeling uh, to understand the question you asked, which is what is it really gonna take? And our modeling shows a lot in common with what you see elsewhere in the country, uh, but Michigan's actually an interesting, and I won't say unique, but a, a good test case. And that's because we're a heavy industrialized economy. Uh, so that gives us load year round. Uh, but we're also uh, a state whose weather in the winter is intense. And especially as we electrify more and more of the load, we see a, a, a really a winter peaking situation emerging. Uh, and our renewables are good, but they're not elite. Uh, and in particular with solar, uh, capacity factors in Michigan that are say 35, 36% in July and August fall to 11 or 12% in December and January. And that leads to the issue that Ernie mentioned for us, which is uh, referred to as the seasonal storage issue. You know, if you're gonna be heavily renewable, how do you deal with those intense winter loads when your renewable capacity is at its bottom, at least from a solar perspective? Uh, today, that's all dealt with, with a trillion cubic feet of natural gas uh, stored beneath the surface of Michigan, that we happen to be the largest natural gas storage uh, state in the union. Uh, that's a giant battery that we draw on to heat homes and run natural gas power plants. But of course, over time that needs to change. So what we see is this playing out in roughly three chapters. It's what our modeling shows. Uh, and I'll just use the 20s, the 30s and the 40s given our 2050 commitment. Uh, the 2020s is all about uh, the continued uh, steady retirement of coal and heavy investment in renewables. In fact, over this whole time frame, that is the dominant investment of uh, renewables. Uh, and enough natural gas to deal with what Ernie talked about in California is we take out all that coal, we will need capacity uh, in order to maintain reliability and backfill some of that energy as, as we uh, also pair it up with renewables. <clears throat> now in parallel to deal with that seasonal storage issue, we're gonna need the federal government to go to work on uh, R&D uh, around things like carbon capture and storage or hydrogen or small modular reactors. And I'll talk more about why later, but those are gonna prove to be critical. The 2030s, the second chapter, continued heavy investment uh, in renewables. We complete uh, the phase out of coal. It's gone at some point in the 2020s. Natural gas continues to play a role, but actually a declining role over time. As more renewables come in, the capacity factors on gas uh, decline, but uh, the gas is there still uh, to, to ensure reliability. But what we need to see in the 2030s is some of these new technologies uh, being commercialized and, and then in the early stages of deployment so that in the 2040s, as we need to go from 80% reduction to net zero, we have the ability to draw upon some of these new technologies to phase gas down or to use gas with carbon capture. And our modeling shows that uh, it'll be vital to either have hydrogen to burn in turbines or gas with carbon capture or that combined with some small modular reactor. We have got to have that if we're going to deal with this, uh, this seasonal storage issue. That whole uh, three chapters takes us from about 30 gigawatts of installed capacity in Michigan to something more like 70 to 85 uh, gigawatts with a healthy dose of storage, but uh, really a lot of that uh, winter capacity needing to be hydrogen or, uh, or nuclear given our weather and our industrial composition. And uh, that said, uh, this is doable. Um, but we do need to get after the technology R&D. And if we don't get after it, we'll hit a certain point where we find uh, the sledding gets hard uh, without those technologies. Interesting you say that, Jerry. Uh, we worked, uh, uh, Bernie and I worked on a study for the Breakthrough Energy Coalition to try to identify the technologies that are needed. And of course, you've cited several of them. And uh, your three chapters add up to a very big book in terms of uh, <laughs> what you're trying to uh, achieve. And a lot of things have to come together. But thank you for that very clear exposition. 
Gina, um, you made a transition of your own uh, not so long ago. You were the EPA administrator. Now you are, since January, the president of NRDC. Kind of wanted to ask you what the transition, how different is it, and uh, kind of what your, kind of where your focus is for NRDC in terms of, uh, of climate. Well, Dan, first of all, thanks for, for letting me be here and for moderating as always. And thanks, gentlemen, for letting me join. Um, it's fun to get some of the old crowd together. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, listen, the, the, the big change going to NRDC is the way I look at it is I was such a nice person at EPA. I was a total pushover. Now I'm going to be a big pain in the butt. That's, that's the transition that I'm looking for. Um, I, I guess probably neither of those things were, were at all true, but it, it is a different spot for me. And I want you to be uh, sort of cognizant of the fact that I'm not just here talking about work we're going to do at NRDC but also I've been pretty um, uh, invested in some of the work uh, with Vice President Biden. I was on the unity task force on the climate side talking about what we thought the vice president should have in his platform and then I was on the DNC platform as well in that committee. So I've been pretty active in a lot of different forums but uh, as you can expect knowing NRDC for a long time we're going to be focused on on uh, things we've done uh, before, which is uh, a lot of our policy, our smart policy and analytics are gonna continue to be done. Um, if you think um, that, that uh, uh, President, uh, it, that it's going to be President Biden in January of next year, then I think you will see a lot more uh, federal initiatives looking at rollbacks that have happened, as well as how we can update those with, with modern ideas for the kind of work that we think we should accomplish, as well as potential opportunities for uh, congressional action. So you can rest assured that NRDC is going to do our best to bring our expertise to those issues. Um, but it, you know, I don't think we, we can expect to stop there. It's, a, it's a, you know, as uh, I think as uh, Jerry just indicated, there's a lot of interest in looking at what this vice president might want to do and try to achieve. And we are all talking about tremendous amount of transition and in a fairly short window of opportunity. And so I think we're going to be using uh, the best we can to talk about the opportunities that clean energy provides to make that transition uh, as quickly as possible. We're going to be looking at, at the fact that wind and solar power, the prices are, are so much lower, something in the order of 70 to 89 percent, respectively, lower than they were just in a decade of time. And so we think there are opportunities that are bound to, to make this transition. And, and we also look forward to the fact that when you're in an economic downturn as we are now, that clean energy jobs are a great investment. So we're going to be trying to convince um, anyone in power that stimulus needs to really focus on, on bringing those clean energy jobs back, which for well over three and a half million a short time ago, but have taken a real hit uh, during this stimulus, as well as opportunities to look at workers and how to advance. Uh, Jerry spoke about the, the, the coal industry, um, and, and we think that there needs to continue to be a lot of opportunities for transition of workers and retraining um, so that folks aren't left behind. Um, but uh, but in, in addition to the, the difficulty of the challenge and the, and the great news that we have lots of technology opportunities available to us, you know, we really need to build our collective will. One of the things that I think that the, the environmental movement um, has needs to continue to push forward more is, is the, our opportunity to really have uh, a bottom up approach to this issue. Um, I think we have if you look at what happened in COVID-19, you will see that the world changed on a dime, which is the, not the kind of change we want, but it did, did tell us that people could change their behavior on a broad scale. And secondly, there was no silver bullet to this. You know, just because we lowered greenhouse gas emissions, it doesn't mean we wanted to trade hundreds of thousands of lives for it. So that's ridiculous, but it did tell us 
that one thing was learned by the American public and it relates big time to the mood and the interest and the focus of the United States right now and of the focus that, that Vice President Biden pulled together. And that is the, the focus on recognizing the communities that have been left behind. Who is damaged more by the burning of fossil fuels? It is, and we've known this, I think all of us collectively have known that the health impact and the burdens fall most on the black communities, communities of color, poor communities. And that really is exacerbated in terms of its interest now by all on the, uh, the focus on racial justice. So the, we have a unique opportunity to really advocate for change in moving away from fossil fuels at a faster pace by focusing on the health impacts of those, by focusing the opportunities for job growth and clean energy, and by making sure that we don't fall short of recognizing the racial injustice that has held our country back for centuries and the opportunity we have now to invest in a more just future. And that is going to be, in my estimation, a big driver for change. It was one of the underpinnings of Vice President Biden's commitment to, to shoot for clean energy in 2035 no more fossil fuels. That's what that calls for. And it's in the environmental justice commitment um, that he identified to, to actually use 40% of the investment of new dollars, stimulus dollars and in investments in infrastructure to go to environmental justice communities was a clear signal that the country's mood has changed. We are not going to settle for anything less than big change fast and that we have to do it in a way that provides benefits to communities that have been left behind first as we move forward. So it will have implications on the kind of change we actually rely on. It has implications for whether it's carbon pricing or a clean energy standard that's going to carry the day. And it's going to have implications on the strength of the, the, uh, the regulations that are going to replace those rolled back regulations moving forward. Thank you, Gina. Uh, you mentioned carbon pricing, yeah. and that I think is a very good transition to, um, to Fred, who has looked to market solutions uh, for some time at EDF, and also bringing stakeholders working together. Uh, Fred, what's the state of that? So the Environmental Defense Fund continues to believe that uh, bringing people together from all different uh, walks of life and parts of society is crucial to solve these problems. Um, you know, it started when we had a partnership with McDonald's uh, to get out of the styrofoam clamshell. Uh, it continues uh, with our work with Walmart, which has pledged a gigaton of carbon removal from their own operations and their supply chain by 2030. Um, and I should point out with all the companies we work for, we accept no uh, payment reimbursement of expenses or fees of any kind. Um, that's a great way of operating when you can solve problems that way. And there's some problems you can solve without government and uh, that makes life easier. But a lot of these problems, including climate change, need government regulation and government legislation. There's no doubt about it. But there again, over the years, we have found out that if we bring stakeholders together uh, and they can join forces to support a solution, uh, the politicians, the elected officials are a lot uh, more likely to adopt that solution. In fact, it, it makes their job easier and they often have thanked us for it. So from 2007 to 2010, uh, an organization called US CAP that included all sorts of uh, stakeholders and, and companies and environmental groups came together and laid the basis for what became Waxman Markey. It had the support of the White House, it had the support of the American public, it passed uh, the US House of Representatives. It did not pass the Senate, so it did not become law, uh, but it was very successful in showing that there is a power, a momentum can be generated by groups of stakeholders getting together. 
Since then, we've worked a lot with many different companies in the power sector, including uh, Excel, uh, you know, which has made this tremendous commitment for 80% clean by 2030. But in many other states too, too numerous to mention, but California, Oregon, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, all of these places uh, and many more, we've worked with utilities and other stakeholders. Today, as Gina mentions, it's imperative that the stakeholder groups be broadened uh, to include not just companies and environmental groups, but labor. Uh, the jobs issues are very important and they're gonna be affected by this transition. And of course, also the communities that are affected most. And I would name here you know, two communities. One, the frontline communities that are living with the pollution from refineries or power plants. Uh, the the um, communities disproportionately people of color who have suffered the burden of air, water, toxic chemical pollution for far too long, but also the communities that have built America in the 20th century uh, that have mined for coal, oil, and gas, uh, that have kept the power plants, the fossil-driven power, power plants running, that are involved in the carbon intensive industries, we have to make sure they are not left behind. Uh, they are brought along. There are new jobs uh, for them, durable jobs uh, as well. You also mentioned, Dan, in your question, market incentives. And I, I would just say we continue to believe that market incentives, flexible approaches are the best way to keep costs down and keep public support for this big transition up. No one wants to see their uh, electric utility rates skyrocket. So doing it in a flexible incentive-based market savvy way while protecting the vulnerable communities at the same time uh, is still the way to go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let me uh, address some questions now to the group here. And I'm gonna ask you all for short answers to this question, but it's an extremely important question. Uh, Gina has already talked about the Biden campaign. Uh, the Biden campaign, campaign and House Select Committee both called for net zero carbon emissions by 2035 uh, in the power sector. I think the Green New Deal called for 100% renewable by 2035. Um, just short answers, how realistic are these goals? The, sh the short answer. First of all, Dan, you can change. Everybody can change their mind next year. Yeah, I, I think the select committee was actually 2040 uh, for net zero on the electricity sector. Uh, and what I would say on 2035, that is really, really tough. But I'm not going to write it off if and probably only if this decade is the supercharged innovation decade. Uh, we have to get all of those new technologies ready to start scaling by 2030 to have a shot at the 2035 electricity uh, goal, uh, let alone the more aggressive uh, energy economy goal. So, Ernie, I think the study we did for Bill Gates Breakthrough Energy Coalition basically said, identify 10 major areas that really were not there yet we have to get to. Uh, You're right, and, and, and we also need uh, new organizations, uh, in government, we need new mechanisms. Uh, so it's a big lift, but, uh, but it's got to be now that we push, frankly, on the accelerator like hell uh, to, uh, to innovate in this decade. Right. So Jerry, uh, what, uh, I mean, you're, you're an executive chairman of DTE, so you have probably, you have to, within a certain framework, but what, what's your beta, you know, just uh, as an observer of the power industry? So Green New Deal, I would put in the unrealistic category. We've modeled it uh, for Michigan. So I mentioned earlier uh, that we, we go from 30 gigawatts installed in Michigan to 70 to 85 to get the net zero. But if we do that 100% renewables, uh, we go to 165 gigawatts and an immense amount of storage inside that number. When I say immense, we have a 2200 megawatt uh, pump storage facility, the fourth largest in the world in Michigan. We'd need the equivalent energy of 300 of those uh, in storage to deal with that seasonal storage issue I talked about. It is both economically and technically 
um, not only expensive, but extremely difficult to pull off. And I don't think in the end would be environmentally positive given the mining for storage devices and the land use. The uh, 2035 issue, I think Ernie's right. Uh, boy, if there's any reality to that, we better have started the R&D uh, and commercialization yesterday. Uh, so in Michigan, um, those three chapters I mentioned, we're, we're investing in 10 to 15 gigawatts of new capacity per year. Uh, that's about half the installed capacity that exists today being, being built each decade. If the chapters become five years, that's 10 to 15 gigawatts every five years. And the last chapter needs to be fundamentally new technologies. So I'm with Ernie, it's, it's really hard. We can get a long way though. We're committed to 80% by, by 2040. I think we can get a long way there, uh, but uh, you know, we better supercharge if we'd have any chance at 2035. So Gina, you've been on the uh, platform committee. You've been deep in the discussions. Where's your bet? Well, my bet in my challenge is that it's not only realistic, it, it's imperative. Um, and I think, you know, er Ernie also ended with this is, you know, we don't have any choice. And, and I think my job isn't, you know, to tell Jerry how to get there. My job is to say you better invest in grid, in, in the grid. You, you better invest in battery storage. You know, I don't think I'm, my, my framing is to, is to obviously, and, and Jerry knows his business a whole lot better than I do, but I think you just got to think bigger. It's not about one utility company making it work. It's about the United States of America protecting our kids in their future. And so we have to shift to renewable energy and we have to have the infrastructure investments to get it there. Dan, could I just uh, inject uh, that, um, Gina, I have to say that seeing battery storage, I think uh, is not helping the discussion uh, by not focusing on the need for massive storage at many different timescales. Um, what we say battery as a palliative when we cannot solve uh, today the longer, the longer storage times. Yeah. I think that's, that's fine, Ernie, but banking on CCS, if the best option is to do enhanced oil recovery is, is, is basically paying Peter to pay Paul. Well, but you know, I, 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 never, I never said that. Well, you said I, CCS, I, I, so that's pretty- uh, well, no, no. So, CCS is one piece of it, but what I'm saying is, if we're going to have wind oh, and solar, I understood what you said. we're going to need storage yep. for days, weeks, seasons. That's correct. Yep. Uh, and that's the harder problem than, right. than the trajectory of yeah. battery cost reduction. Yeah. yeah. But I think you and I know that when, when I'm not a, a big fan of, of just focusing all the attention on technology as much as continuing to drive market solutions by making some demand that we continue to progress forward quickly. And so I think there is going to be a role for standard setting and, and, and as a way to, to send all the clearest sure. market signals, because I don't have you as energy secretary to do what you did last time, which is to throw a chunk of money on clean energy. But I'm hoping people will still continue to do that in the next administration and, and we'll make some progress moving forward. And on that, we all, I think, heartily agree. Well, I think, uh I think the focus is rightly uh, come around to what we need to do in the 2020s. And it, we have to uh, do what's been talked about. There's got to be a big investment in R&D. Absolutely. At the same time, uh, as Gina is right, there is an imperative uh, for the electricity sector to do more faster than the rest of the economy. And the power sector has already proven that you can do it. Uh, there's an opportunity too for the electricity sector, which is that in order to decarbonize trucks and cars, uh, homes and commercial spaces, heating and cooling, the best way so far it looks like is going to be to electrify. So there's a lot of uh, new plants that will need to be built, new transmission lines, new capacity, uh, and there's money to be made. Uh, there as well. So th this is a real opportunity for the electric sector, I think, to join forces for the sort of more ambitious plans that Excel is already committed to an 80% reduction by 2030. That's uh, a good example of 
where we need to go and what will enable us to meet that imperative, do as much as we can in the 2020s, because that sets us up uh, for the years beyond. So yeah, I, I will say, uh, Fred, that um, you know, with with the sector at 45 percent uh, by 2019, I think we're going to be deep into the move by 2030. And I'll also say that a shift I've seen in the industry uh, over the past four years, uh, when Gina served up the clean power plan, we were grappling with the issue. I think uh, the industry rightly sees this now as what you said. It's a that's an incredible opportunity. Uh, so we are Jerry, going to, we're going to electrify the economy. Right. So let yeah. me ask uh, a, a question that there's not going to be agreement on here, but it's because as we get to the uh, end of this uh, lively discussion, uh, what's the role of natural gas and what's the role of nuclear in, um, in for the next 10, 15, 20 years for utilities? Who's going to start? <laughs> Well, I can start with that one as, okay. a, as a utility. You, you sort of told us um, you're about your book, Jerry. Right. <laughs> I think it, you can only describe it as a, a changing role um, and, and ultimately a diminishing role. Um, so I, as we- For both, for both nuclear and gas. No, I, I'll start with gas. I was really thinking of, of gas. I mean, it's, it's played a really important role here in the early phases as we've, as we pull down coal and invest in renewables, uh, we've, we've seen you know, gas now at 38% of national supply and coal down to 23. We're gonna take the rest of that coal out. We're gonna chase it hard with renewables, but, but gas will be there playing an important role for some period of time. But then it does need to decline and it will. Uh, capacity factors will continue to decline as renewables continue to ramp up. And ultimately it's there in more of a peaking uh, and pure capacity role. And then I think ultimately you either need to get that carbon captured or replace it with a different fuel like hydrogen. For nuclear, uh, the maintenance of the current fleet is just critical. I mean, it's more than half of the zero carbon energy that we have. And if we lost that, the hill uh, becomes so much steeper to that uh, goal. Whenever the date is, it's a lot steeper. So maintaining that uh, for the, the interim is really important. And, you know, beyond that, it's all up to the economics of uh, these new reactors, small modular reactors, as, as we attempt to commercialize them. If they can compete well with uh, turbines burning hydrogen, then they'll have a life. And if hydrogen turns out to, to have the edge, um, then we'll see a lot more of that. Yeah. Could, could I uh, I'll just add on, uh, first on, on the nuclear, that uh, a, critical, a critical issue uh, for what Jerry was talking about, which is not discussed a lot, is uh, whether or not uh, a lot of the current fleet gets a license extension to 80 years. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's 60 years, uh, those plants are going to start going offline very fast in the 2030s, which makes the goals we're talking about really tough. Obviously, if you add 20 years to that, uh, you get past, past mid-century. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, really, that's really important. On natural gas, I think one of the things that uh, uh, I, I agree with what Jerry said, but I would just add, I think we don't talk enough about how natural gas has been an enabler for the introduction of uh, wind and solar uh, uh, at, at, the current, at the current pace. And we're going to have to figure out how that function uh, continues uh, with gas, with gas, with CCS, with hydrogen, uh, whatever, whatever it is, uh, because that's not going away for the reasons we discussed earlier. Batteries are not going to solve the storage problem of, of wind and solar. It solves part of the problem. Uh, and, uh, and I think that gas will be uh, also part of the hydrogen transition. Uh, certainly right now, uh, blue hydrogen is much cheaper than green hydrogen, for example. And there will continue to be regional differences in the preferred mm -hmm. approach to low to no carbon hydrogen. But I would, I, I'd like to inject just one last element, uh, Dan, which has not been in the conversation. I'm actually convinced that we are going to need significant negative carbon technologies deployed by mid-century. Yeah. After all, that's what the net is in net zero. And in fact, if we want to, there's a very unproductive discussion 
about uh, negative carbon technologies not, not being invested in because somehow but they're negative carbon. Ta- do you mean carbon capture? Uh, no, uh, it, it could be direct air capture. Oh, right. It can it can be uh, new cultivars with deep roots. It can be accelerated min- mineralization. Many many and ways. Say, and you started so, to say there's a, a take a, carbon a, out of the atmosphere. And and since I think we all aspire later in the century, not just to net zero, but to net negative. Okay, but but Ernie, let me interrupt you when you said unproductive. Yeah. What do you do? You, what do you mean that people? Just there don't want there to- are there are some. Uh, who argue against uh, what I think is essential, a major innovation push on negative carbon technologies. Because first of all, they are going to be important to get to net zero by getting you away from the uh, very, very steep cost curve to get the last tons out. But secondly, they are by definition essential Mm -hmm. if we are ever to get to net negative technologies. So let me go, let me yeah. go now, Gina. I think uh, you may. What's your perspective on this? <laughs> Are you baiting me? <laughs> I'm just giving you the floor. Could be, could be. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no well, I, I was Gina. <laughs> uh, I'm the neutral moderator. A- actually, you know, I think direct <laughs> air capture is kind of uh, of kind of interesting. You know, do I think it's an ultimate solution? No, um, but but I don't disagree that we have to look at 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 opportunities like that. But, what but, about but gas if and I'll, I'll get to it. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> nuclear, the, the challenge I think for me in nuclear is first, why any utility would want to, to construct a nuclear facility now with the, with the old technology is beyond me. Um, it's hugely expensive, and to me, it makes no sense because we still haven't resolved many of the other challenges with the nuclear waste and other things. But this, the second uh, issue is that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting on, on Ernie, and he shouldn't be talking here. He should be working to get a, a new <laughs> nuclear that doesn't look like the old ones. Now, relative to the extent- We are. <laughs> I know you are, but you're, you're sitting here chit-chatting. Get busy. Um, I don't really know enough about those to speak to it, and I have a world of respect for Ernie. So he knows these issues. I just deal with people a lot and I worry that that whether or not people will accept it and how we move that forward. But I think more importantly is that with the existing nuclear wanting extensions, you know, the, obviously the concern is that some of them are already not in great shape. And, and so I think we really need to think hard about relicensing and what the real opportunity is to have them safely run as opposed to just rely on a certain number of decades out of them. So I think we have to think about that. On natural gas, Ernie, I don't have any doubt that without abundant natural gas giving us an ability to have a transition away from coal, that we would still be struggling to wonder whether or not coal is going to remain in the mix, which I think everybody knows now it isn't. Having said that, it is still a fossil fuel. It still has to be phased out. And Jerry, you know, was very honest about that. The question really is the pace of change. And part of the really annoying part of the equation, if I can, you know, express some annoyance here, is that, you know, rollbacks of standards on methane, uh, on leak detection and reduction in leaks in methane does absolutely no good for the natural gas utilities, in my opinion. You're just fueling the flames of, of people who don't want fracking, of which I have now become one. And, and you're, you're gonna be really challenged every step of the way on any new natural gas pipeline because we find those that FERC or others say are necessary or DPUCs get stopped and they're no longer necessary. So there's, there's a whole other dynamic for how we do analysis and communicate it. And, and I just am unwilling to, at this point, say that by 2035, we won't have a lot more opportunity for a range of technology investments if we remain focused on saying we are going to do it in 2035. I have tremendous faith in Ernie and others who really think every day about what's the next market to do? How do we reduce this? So I am not going to treat natural gas as if it's a favored son or daughter. 
um, I think we have to reduce our reliance on that as quickly as possible. So Fred, it's, uh, you get the final word here. Well, uh, first of all, on, uh, on negative technologies, I think the, the discussion that Ernie alludes to is when they're oversold as a panacea. I'm not saying Ernie's doing that, but many people do say we can be relatively complacent now because we'll have this great stuff later. I do agree uh, with everybody else on this panel, we should be investing in this. But the costs right now are prohibitive. It's nowhere near uh, in the money. And so it's a long term thing. But absolutely, we should be doing R&D. On nuclear, the existing capacity to the extent the plants can ke be kept running safely, it's a big help to have zero carbon technologies. And they should be kept running safely. On advanced nuclear, they're going to have to meet not only the test that Jerry's put forward of much less costly than they've been to date, but also the test that I know Jerry would agree with, they've got to be safe and Absolutely. convince people that they are safe. And finally, on natural gas, uh, it's been extremely disappointing to me that uh, <clears throat> with the exception of some of the uh, natural gas companies, including uh, Shell and, and BP, Chevron, a lot of the industry has encourage the Trump administration to roll back the methane standards that uh, EPA under Gina put in place. Um, and so the natural gas transition from coal actually has had much less benefit than many believe because the insidious effect of methane, it's so powerful, erases a lot of the benefit that the industry could have given us. Uh, I don't see, uh, anywhere near enough support from either the natural gas industry or the power industry in strong EPA regulations to deal with existing sources. I don't think EEI is yet on record. Yeah, we actually are. For strong existing source regulations, let's check that. Well, we um, need to, I think we've, I totally agree with you and Gina that the the rollback of methane standards is short-sighted and, and needs to be turned around. What When I say EEI is on record, we've decided that we need to chase this back up the supply chain. We need to chase the pipelines and the producers and say, we simply are going to demand uh, that you make this as clean and low carbon a fuel as possible. But Jerry, it's got to be done not just through voluntary actions. We're all for voluntary actions. We need EEI to be supporting standards and regulations. So the whole industry, there's 2,000, more than 2,000 natural gas producers, and we're not going to clean them up without regulations. And that's the very last point I would make, Dan, is that Instead of arguing about which technologies are going to work, we should all be focused in, on having a durable, mandatory legal limit on how much greenhouse gases can be put into the air from the entire economy. That'll give industry the stability it know, needs to make investments and figure out how to get there in the cheapest way. Could I, well, Dan, let me just add that. Okay, I think we quickly, all, Ernie. Yeah, we should all recognize that EDF has done fabulous work on methane. And mm -hmm. I just want to reinforce the point that methane is the Achilles heel of the natural gas role in this, uh, in this transition. Well, and finally, just show my enormous technology optimism. When we say nuclear, we shouldn't forget that there's fusion in addition to fission. <laughs> Can you just put a date on that, Ernie? We need a date. Uh, so on I, that note, okay. uh, let me say that our topic today was uh, what's ahead for the clean energy transition. And I think the answer is a lot, a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenges, and a lot of new policies coming down the pike. So I want to thank our terrific panel for their uh, excellent uh, discussion and for really opening our minds on these issues and what's ahead on the clean energy transition. And thank you all for joining us. And let me now turn it back to e EEI Chairman Ben Fogue. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was a stimulating and insightful dialogue, and we certainly have our work cut out for us. I also want to thank our terrific panelists, Jerry Anderson, Fred Krupp, Gina McCarthy, and Ernie Moniz. All of them will be available for a live chat in just a moment. 
Now, as a reminder, all of our summit content will be archived for 30 days. Simply visit the Virtual Conference Center for details. Please plan to rejoin the EI Virtual Leadership Summit tomorrow starting at 1245 Eastern for more great content. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.